So I will talk about the ethics crisis in computing. There is a question mark, and we'll come back to the question marks in, in a few minutes. Let's talk a little bit about trust. Has anybody ever played the trust fall game? It's very often happened like you have kind of a bonding corporate uh, thing to do, and you have to stand on some platform, and you have to fall backwards, and you have to trust that people will, <laughs> will catch you, and it's, uh, you believe that they will catch you, and you hope that they will. So it turns out that trust is an in incredibly important concept that we don't talk much about. There is a, a Wittgenstein, who is an important 20th century philosopher, once wrote that every game has an unwritten rule. And the rule is, follow the rules of the game. And you think, OK, if it's unwritten, let's write it. But then you need another rule, unwritten rule, that says, follow that rule. So you always need not only common knowledge, which is the standard assumption in game theory, that the, that the rules of the game are common knowledge, means everybody knows, everybody knows, everybody knows, and so on and so forth. But everybody has to trust that the other players are following the rule. And we use it all the time. You go to a traffic light, and you have a green light. And you just drive through because you trust that the traffic light works, and that the other players know that red light means stop. And if you want to know what it is like when you lose the trust, Go to some third world country yeah. where people have a different attitude about traffic light. Okay? Democracy is another kind of a game that requires trust. It only makes sense for you to behave in a particular way if you, if you trust that everybody else is following the rules. Eternal trust has a huge economic value. Do you trust the economic players to behave according to the rules? So an article from the Financial Times, the report on research that look at high trust countries, like Sweden is a high trust country, and Russia is a low trust is a low trust country, and this has huge implication. They lose lots of money. They leave money on the table essentially because of it's a low trust country. So there is now a crisis of trust of trust in technology. To trust technology, we have to be familiar with the technology. Well, we are technologists, or most assume everybody here, or most everybody is technologists, but society at large do not understand really what's going on in the technology. You have to trust the people who, if not, or you say, I don't understand it, but I trust the people who developed it. Or I trust the company, or I trust the industry. But what if it's none of the above? So should we trust technology today? Look at cybersecurity. It's just an embarrassment. I think it's a collective failure of our profession. You know, you hear about another breach, another breach, another breach. Sometimes you hear about it a year later, you hear, you hear about the breach. Privacy is, people have pronounced privacy is dead. Surveillance has become a business model. We'll come back to it. Automated decision making, you know, we all talk about explainable AI here, but we all know that explainable AI is a term of aspiration and research. It's not a reality at this point. Um, do we trust technology vendor? You can go and try to retweet their secure uh, privacy policy. Good luck. Okay? Um, you shouldn't really trust anything, you know. I just saw in the news that uh, Mark Zuckerberg has announced that, that privacy is the new business model of Facebook. Oh, yes, and I have a bridge to sell you between uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn. <laughs> and, um, you know, basically, do we really, these people are hypocrites. You know, they say, you know, do no evil, and now they're trying to run away from it. You know, we find that the tax exec limits the technology that children use at home. This is technology for your children, not for their children. This is endemic to the tech industry. And if you don't trust me on this one, you can listen to Mark Benioff, who said last year, there is a crisis of trust concerning data, data privacy and cybersecurity. And I would say it's even borders than just these, these two areas. This Facebook is going to solve these problems. Absolutely. <laughs> so, and in fact, we are facing now something that people are calling the tech clash. And I can spend here half an hour telling you about what's happening in the media. But to me, it became very clear. I said, oh my god. It was an OMG moment when in 2017, Peggy Noon and the Wall Street Journal uh, wrote an article about, about gun ownership. And the, the argument was, was incredibly weak. But nevertheless, why do people need, feel they need to have guns? Because all of their personal financial information got hacked in the latest breach. Because our country's real overloads are in Silicon Valley and appear to be moral Martians. I love the phrase. She really has a way with phrases. Moral Martians or operate on some weird new postmodern ethical wavelengths. I'm not sure what postmodernism has to do with it, but nevertheless. 
and they will be the one programming the robot that soon will take our jobs. And I can come, I can go on and on and on about quotes from the mainstream media now. You know, there is a, I can show you a clip comparing big tech to big tobacco. So I want to take one concrete example. So in uh, 2017, John G. Robert, the Chief Justice of the United States, visited the uh, RPI and had a fireside chat with Shirley Ann Jackson, who was the president. And she asked him, can you foresee a day when smart machine driven with artificial intelligence, intelligence says, ah, wonderful, artificial intelligence, I don't think it's a typo, will assist with courtroom fact-finding or more controversially even judicial decision-making. And he said, it's a day that's here and it's putting the different strengths on how the judiciary goes about doing things. So you can go and see that today machine learning is already being deployed in the justice system in many applications, bail, sentencing, parole, separating children from parents. These are all very difficult decisions, huge implication on people's life. It's very hard for people to make this decision. Why not delegate it to a machine, especially if you find this beautiful website about advancing justice and embracing community, you know, what, what can be wrong with that? So at the same time, we're already learning about machine bias. I think this is one of the hottest topics now today, machine learning, machine bias. And already this has been shown a few years ago by, by a big expose by ProPublica. They are the first one who came and says that, uh, that the data reflect historical bias. And there is a, we know, there is not a, I'm not telling you any secrets, and in this, in this country, there is a bias against blacks. And when you train the data on that, now you have making decisions that are biased. And they show that identical profile with the only difference is race, makes a difference with recommendation by this system. Um, and, and in fact, people have done more serious scientific study. And that was last year, that was in Science Advances and they evaluated the software Compass, and they showed that why the software claimed to look at 137 different attributes, at the end it seems to, to be a linear, linear classifier based on two features, and actually any reasonable person would come up to the same decisions. But it's just easier for the judges or the people who have to make decisions to say, well, the system said so, you know, the computer said so, what can I say differently? And so just to make this kind of a bit extreme, let's talk about Fluffy. So Fluffy is a nice black Labrador, and Fluffy can smell risk of recidivism. Very, very smart dog. And in fact, its accuracy has been even tested. We did A-B testing. Fluffy passed the test. <laughs> and, but Fluffy is a black box. You can see Fluffy is a black box, <laughs> and it does not provide explanation, but makes good decision. Would you allow Fluffy to make parole decision. Would we allow a dog to make parole decision? The answer is, well, Compass is a black box. Fluffy is a black box. Now, most people would say it's ridiculous to put a, court in the, in the, a, a dog in the courtroom and make decisions, but we let machine learning make this kind of decision, and I claim is that it's not so clear that it's much different than a dog that has been very well trained. I'm, re I have been re I'm reminded of a novel that I read about 30 years ago, my son was a teenager. It's difficult to talk to teenagers, so I said, okay, I'm going to read the books that he reads, so we'll have something to talk about. And I read Ender's Game. And I'm going to, people who didn't read it, it's a good novel, but I'm going to, spoiler alert, if you don't like to, to what I'm telling you now. The, the nut, in a nutshell, what it is about is a teen, group of teenagers led by Ender, who is a teenager, and they think they're playing video games, but they're really fighting an intergalactic war and they win, they, wi they win the game, and they realize at the end that they have won the war, and they have destroyed the civilization. All these alien shoot up that they were playing, they were real alien, they were really shooting them up, and they destroyed the planet. And suddenly to me, this suddenly it resonates, and I don't know if this is uh, also Scott Card had this in mind, but I got into computers because it was a fun game. It was just solving puzzles every day. What can be, you know, you solve puzzles every day, and you get, you, you're nicely paid for that. This is a great career. And suddenly we realize, no, this is for real. This is for real. And today, we are technology is at the center of everything, and we are it. We thought we were just playing a game. And if you look at the media, suddenly 
ethics is hot. Ethics, 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 ethics. You go New York Times, take ethical dark side, a Boston Globe, ethics crisis, New York Times, every computer, every company need ethics, chief ethics officer, CEO will start meaning something different, <laughs> chief ethics officer, uh, Facebook of all company is giving seven and a half million dollar to Institute for Ethics in, in AI, I think in Europe, I think in Munich, perhaps. Ethics is hot. And I want to be the ethics skeptic here. So, and I, I want to use an example, the automobile. So, 1908 was the one of the most important years in the 20th century. <coughs> because the Ford Model T rolled off the production line and became the first mass-consumed, mass-produced automobile. Change America. If you want to ask, what is the most industrial product in the 20th century? It's the automobile, it's not the computer. The computer is the, of, in the 21st century. But we came fairly late in the, in the 20th century to have huge impact on society. Now we're having this impact. But the automobile shaped America, and make America into a United States, into a world power. And very quickly people discover the automobiles kill people. Every year more than a million people around the globe gets died with car crashes. So we said, okay, we need to do something about it. Now, if there are many ways you look at mortality, let's see if I can figure it out. There are many ways you can look no, at mortality by car, but people who care look at death per billion vehicles miles traveled, which is traveling a mile. How many people do you kill when you, tr when you travel one mile? And if you look at the red line, you see that we have done a pretty good job of reducing this in a very significant way. There is a spike now. Now, actually, it's become riskier to drive or travel by car because DWT, driving while texting. That's the new killer. That's the biggest risk. To, if you're a teenager, if you're teenager children, this is the biggest risk to their life, is driving while texting. But generally, we've done a fantastic job in reducing mortality. And we do it by a whole variety, by youth, by a plethora of different measures, you know, mirrors, Antilog brakes, airbag, crosswalk, traffic lights, laws. A whole system has developed because we love automobiles, but we want to make them safer. Now, what we did not say is ethic training for drivers. What's the solution to drunk driving problem? Let's take every drive, driver and send them to an ethics course. You get a diploma, okay, now you can drive in ethics. No, we developed, we had public policy. We said, this is, we like the technology, but we want to mitigate the risk and the adverse impact of the technology. It's public policy, it's not ethics. So let's take the internet as an example. You go back, if you're old enough, you may remember the, the well in the 1980s, which was kind of the beginning of this kind of the internet culture, if you want, and then you may remember the, the Usenet, okay? This wonderful electronic white bulletin board, you can ask questions, you can have discussion, it was amazing thing. And it grew up by people, who, uh, the people who developed it were shaped by the 1960s. The 60s happened in the actually in the 70s. But this was, I call it the hippie culture. And one value that came out of it was information wants to be free. Of course, information doesn't want anything. But somehow that mantra stuck, information wants to be free. And when the World Wide Web came about, it was the idea was, an idea that we all fell in love with, an unfettered sharing of information. What can go wrong? Well, very quickly we discovered that if you have, everybody can put their information, there's too much information, you can't find anything. So the initial enthusiasm we realized, my goodness, how do I find anything? It's a library without a card catalog. How do I find anything in a big library without a card catalog and no, and no do decimal system to even sort books? Just a huge library with books in random order. I cannot even find books in my own office. <laughs> so the first solution was a card catalog and it was a Yahoo idea. And it worked for a couple of years, and then people discover it doesn't scale. It grows too fast. You cannot catalog the internet. And so we discover, no, we need uh, search engines. And there were some various search engines. You may remember Alta Vista, Lycos, and the while. And they were just not very good. You search for something, and you have to scroll and scroll and scroll to find something that's really useful. Um, I remember, actually, kind of an embarrassing thing. I used Alta Vista to check the, the concept, a phrase that somebody told me, perfumed beer. And the thing that came up on the first thing that came on the screen was real pictures from a, a porn, porn, gay porn site. And I was in a public library. <laughs> and I was almost dropped the computer on the floor just to stop it because I couldn't get out of there. 
And then Google came up with a fantastic, very high quality search engine, really very high quality. And that was a kind of a good solution. And then the question was, how do we monetize free information? How do we monetize it? That was the question. And Google came up with a brilliant solution, advertising. That was the, the, the how do we make money? Advertising. Basically, they did not invent advertising, but they adopted advertising from, from newspaper and TV. And then people very quickly discovered, most people just ignore, you, you learn, your eyes learn very quickly to ignore advertisements. And so to make them effective, the click rate was so low, advertisers were balking. I said, why should we pay for this? Nobody is clicking. So the other a brilliant solution came, micro-targeted advertising. We need to target and show you advertising personally tailored to you, not just generic advertising. So how do we tailor this to you? We start by based on the search that you are doing, but even that was not enough. The more we learn about you, the more we can target advertising to you. <coughs> and we have no idea how much data they are collecting. I mean, we find out that uh, some of the data collecting is, for example, Google goes to the real world. They have agreement with MasterCard. Everything that every transaction you make with MasterCard, Google wants to know. Another one that, that came up, I think, just about last week. If you have an app, for example, for tracking menstrual, menstrual cycles, maybe because uh, you want to get pregnant, Facebook knows about it because the app passed information to, to Facebook. So what we got out of this, and this is a very important book that just came out, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. If you're not paying for it, then you're the product. That's the reality. So this is, this is a very important book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. So how well is it working for Google? Well, you can see Google's revenue. The answer is this business model is a fantastic business model. It's working very, very well, very well for Google. This is 2017, I don't have the 18, I suspect by now it's about 100 revenue, 100 billion dollar a year from advertising. So this was, if you look at Google, kind of success story, I would say three elements, a very good, first of all, a search engine, the page rank was a, a brilliant idea, scalable infrastructure, what Jeff Dean et al. have built at Google, and the third one, a brilliant business model that's working extremely well, and of course, Facebook, that when came online, when Facebook came, they said, okay, this is the business model that we're going to pursue. So if we're going to take now Sergey Brin and Larry Page to an ethics boot camp and teach them about maybe the evil of, of uh, the loss of privacy that their business model has, has and they, do you think they're going to come home after one week at uh, the, Institute of, the Institute of Ethics at Munich and they'll go and say, you know what, guys, we've discovered we don't like this uh, target advertising ethically. It has some, you know, we don't quite like, like it. Let's do something else. It's not going to happen. It's a company. They have a successful business model. That's what they're going to do. In fact, Google has been trying now for the past several years to run away from do no evil. Started there at the top, and I don't think they're quite there to delete it, but it just gradually gets pushed and pushed and pushed, hidden some in some document. It still appears, but they've been trying to run away from it for many years now. Now, is there really a free lunch? So some people are saying, well, Google provides fantastic services for free. Is it really for free? Google makes $100 billion. Who pays for it? Well, the advertisers pay for it. But where do the advertisers get the money? From consumers. And consumers pay for these services, but in an opaque way. So the answer is, who pays for this? We pay for this. This is in something you can think of it as an opaque tax. So people say that people are willing to give the data because of the, they get these free services. But it turns out that most people have a very dim understanding of what is really going on with data. So I mean, this is a, a recent survey from, from Pew. They did a survey. and. <coughs> Miss people have no idea. You can go and dig way, way, way down in, in uh, Facebook. Preferences go give deep way, way down, and you'll find out more, for example, all kind of profile that, Google, that Facebook has on you. Most people have no idea because it's not easy to go and dig, dig, dig down and go down there. And when you finally get to that point and you say, how does Facebook characterize you? Most people say, no, it's not me. So I think of myself as a 
centrist in terms of political philosophy. If I go to Facebook, they say extreme liberal. I don't know who is right, Facebook or me, not clear. How many people here use Gmail? Good. How many people read Terms of Service? <laughs> Well, <laughs> there, is a, there is a reason why you don't read it. It's really unreadable. It's a document, long document written by lawyers. Lawyers are meant to read, to lawyers write it, lawyers read it. The rest of us find it's impossible to read. So why is there that there is no really serious IT policy as opposed to other areas where we have much stronger policy? When you talk about, again, again, uh, safety, automobile safety, there is, there is public policy. And when it comes to technology, Information technology, there is none. Well, we have a big industry today. You know, the market cap fluctuate between three and a half to four and a half trillion dollars. It's a very powerful industry. And that industry has traditionally lobbied against regulation. And the argument was, why should we regulate? Why should you not regulate? Because regulation stifles innovation. This is the mantra that you hear all the time, why sh one should not regulate. Uh, Elon Musk kept getting into trouble with the SEC by tweeting things that you should not be tweeting. So Wired Magazine says, the case against Elon Musk will chill innovation. So we should not say anything bad about Elon Musk because we don't want to chill innovation. <laughs> now, companies will tell you, well, but we have corporate responsibility. So corporate responsibility is a term that goes back to the 60s. And the idea is that uh, corporations have many stakeholder, the expression, it's the shareholder, the customer, the employee, the community, and the management will have to balance the interest of all, all of them, and they have to be responsib responsible citizens. But that's the 60s. In the 1980s, another dogma became to dominate the business, the business uh, environment, and this is shareholder, va shareholder value. And you mostly have to maximize the return to the shareholders who suddenly are perceived as the owner, the real owner of the company, which is legally just not the case. A corporation is a, is a, is a, is a person. Remember, it's a, I'm not owned by anyone. Corporation is not really owned by anyone. But instead of thinking of shareholders as an investor, we think of them as owner, and suddenly this has become the dominant, dominant dogma. So technology is clearly today driving the future. But the question, who is doing the steering? And the answer is society has relinquished doing the steering to tech corporations. And even the business community is trying to, to wake up and say, wait a minute, beware of tech companies playing government. We should not let tech companies do run society. We should let society run society. So technology has moved very fast. Public policy has lagged behind. And in what is the purpose of innovation? Innovation is not by itself a goal. Innovation it just means to an end. The real goal is societal <coughs> progress. But unless we try to connect it, we have innovation running amok. So is ethics important? I'm the last person who will tell you that you should not be ethical. Of course, you should be an ethical person. I'm teaching right now a course at, at Rice University about computing ethics and society. Of course, we want people to think about ethics. And some people think that ethics is the only thing. So Ben Cooper wrote an article, very good article. I highly recommend reading it. It appeared in CSM a couple of years ago. And he says, ethics exists to encourage trustworthiness and cooperation among members of society. It's able to do much more than the blunt instrument of the law. But I think this, this is overselling ethics in some sense. Ethics should inform public policy. So for example, most of us find that uh, selling organ for money will exploit poor people. And we find the idea that poor people selling, selling kidneys, we find morally repugnant. That's ethics. But we didn't say, OK, this is bad. We said there are laws against organ selling. If you are a patient in the United States and you need a kidney, you are not allowed to go and you know, the hospital would, cannot implant a kidney because you paid for it. So public policy has to balance ethics, and ethics is about individual responsibility, regulation, which is public decision making, societal responsibility, and I think we leave to market. We let, we let the market sort it out. And balancing between them is difficult. And we're going to hear more about it now from, from people who, are, who have thought harder about regulation. And of course, you can find there is a debate. You have the, the National Review, that basically say, no, 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 there are ills that there are societal, there are wounds that public so policy cannot heal, so we should stay away from this. And other people say, yes, but this become a trap for doing nothing. So just everything in life, you have to find the, the, the golden path between difficult options. 
And you see different approaches. The US take a technology specific approach. Europe is more looking at the societal impact. Uh, certain technology are now all encompassing, so we need some international treaties. In fact, Microsoft called for some kind of a Geneva Convention for certain aspects of information technology. And of course, a huge question on the table is big tech too big? Have we, do we have, when we have a small number of corporations with market cap of around $40 trillion, is that an issue by itself? And that has been already been raised. So I want to finish by a quoting some of the, what I call the, the, the patron, patron saints of computing. The first was Leibniz. And he is the first one that was thinking about actually mechanizing reasoning. Calculus ratio sinato, mechanized reasoning. And he wrote, mankind, if you do that, mankind will then possess a new instrument that will enhance the capabilities of the mind to a far greater extent than optical instruments strengthen the eye. So the idea was, again, this technology is supposed to help us. And about uh, 200 years later, when Charles Babbage was conceiving of the analytical engine, and the letter exchange between him and, and Ada Lovelace. And what was his goal? He was an entrepreneur. He wanted to make money. And Ada Lovelace write to him, oh, it's okay, I'm okay with you making money. But to, I wish to add my might towards expounding and interpreting the Almighty, his laws and works for the most effective use of mankind. Ultimately, this technology should serve society rather than the other way around. Thank you very much. Never before has so much of what people do been available online, and never before have we had such powerful tools to understand what's happening. So while many people talk about the tsunami, the flood of data, drowning in data, uh, uh, I quite prefer to see it as the sweet flowing waters that irrigate the <laughs> paths to innovation. And that's where I want to go. And I think we can make this happen in a positive and constructive way. Okay, so uh, the concerns about this and about uh, machine learning, statistical methods, and algorithms is profuse. I mean, <laughs> Moshe talked about some of them, but there's reports from hundreds of organizations. I've featured a few on the next six slides here. My favorite, if you're going to read one, is the IEEE Ethically Aligned Design Report, about to come out in its next uh, version, but take a look at that. But algorithmic accountability and the Electronic Frontier Foundation focuses on malicious use of AI, forecasting prevention. And you get you know, groups from every range of the spectrum, uh, algorithmic impact statements, Oops, skip one there, but uh, European unions, um, business groups, uh, public interest groups, think tanks, um, member congressional groups, European uh, parliamentary groups, and so on. Uh, it just goes on. And as, you know, being part of the Washington policy circles, I wind up reading these things. And to this week in Paris, maybe it was not Geneva, as you suggested, but in Paris, the principles of, for AI towards a humanistic approach, global conference with some serious players and heavy discussions was on Monday. And this next version of the IEEE report comes out March 25th. So do take a look at that one. Now, my own part of this goes back to the first edition of the book I mentioned. And in that book, there was a section that talked about balancing automation and human control. And the assumption there was there was a single line between human control and the aspiration of computer control and that there was one line and we were somewhere along this. This was reinforced by Tom Sheridan's writings at MIT, a human factors, control room design, who person who coined the phrase, the useful one, supervisory control. But he had 10 levels, which he described each of those levels, about what those were and where we were and how we were moving towards greater and more effective machine control. Over the years, I came to reject this notion. And it was a struggle to see out of that box of a single dimension. But in the last editions of the book, that section is now called Ensuring Human Control While Increasing the Level of Automation. 
ensuring human control. So I became devoted to the principle that humans remain in control even as computers get more powerful, not more intelligent, <laughs> not deeper in control, but to me there became separate lines here. Computers are not on the same line and metric as people are. People are not computers, computers are not people. That's the central dogma. Very simple paradigm. <laughs> you know, P is not equal. Uh, people are not computers, computers are not people. And so that idea is what's been driving my way of thinking more recently to try to shape up the ways in which people can be more in control while we increase the level of automation. Now, I'm not the only one saying this. The Apple design guidelines, the Microsoft ones, also say user control. People, not apps, should be in control, are in control. And then flexibility. Give users complete, fine-grained control over their work. So the commercial world, or responsible, some responsible figures who build real products for real people, know that the way forward for successful commercial adaptation is to give users fine-grained control over what happens, okay? And that when you have uncomprehensible, unpredictable, uncontrollable tools, people shy away from them. And so the devotion towards building powerful tools that people have a sense of trust, as Moshe described, safety and a sense of control became important. I'm a great fan of Kathy O'Neill's book called Weapons of Math Destruction, which has powerful examples, a dozen chapters. She's a Harvard statistician, PhD, worked with on Wall Street, and wrote this wonderful book, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. And her three distinguishing points are sort of getting past the recommender systems, the lightweight kind of things in game playing, and towards consequential things of hiring and firing and parole decisions, medical decisions, <coughs> mortgages, etc. And her three criteria are the places she's interested in are where there's opacity, there's scale, and there can be damage, and damage to property or health. Okay? She writes, these algorithms slam doors in the face of millions of people, often for the flimsiest of reason, and offer no appeal, like Fluffy. They're unfair and stronger, I would say, Algorithms can be biased, harmful, and deadly. So that's the sort of central proposition here. And the way out of it, uh, I start with maybe something related to ethics. And for me, the key word is responsibility. And my short piece about this appears in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which talks about the strategies that I'm about to lay out to you, about how we go about developing independent oversight to provide the kinds of regulation that Moshe was asking for. Many people talk about this with different languages. Accountability and liability are legal terms. I've learned much from Ryan over the years. Fairness and transparency, FAT ML conference was already mentioned. Fairness and transparent uh, machine learning uh, in the five or six years has produced a lot of interesting research, but there's a skepticism that it's gone very academic and needs to get closer to the real problems that people have. Thank you, Bill, for shaking in support. And then the arise of explainability, explainable algorithms, the DARPA XAI, explainable AI program is one example, and the 11 projects within that are promising directions. Not enough of where I want to go, but I think they get somewhere. And another notion which has a more mathematical logistic approach is interpretability of these things. Cynthia Rudin's work particularly, I think, is another example of where these things can go technically. But today I'm not after a technical talk, uh, I'll, but to focus on the policy approaches. And for that I start with the ACM uh, statement on algorithmic transparency and accountability. You're not expected to read that, but there were seven principles that I will focus on. So the first of them, they said seven things need to happen. And I was part of the group that drafted this thing. I got some of the things I wanted, but I'm not happy. So, you know, it's a good start, but it's time to move on with now fleshing out the meaning. That's why I was pushing for, it's, we agree, there's a problem, we agree, it's time to do something. What do we do? Who does it is really the question. It's not just we need to, and I see we should, 
The shoulds are what it is. What does that mean? What does that mean? Give me a break. It's time to grow up and start saying who does what by when. Who does what by when. That's how you get things done in Washington. You have a deadline because there's a bill coming up. You need to get something changed and you want paragraph 7 to include the following sentence. Okay? That's how things happen. You have to get focused and specific. So, awareness. Owners, designers, builders, users. I was successful to get them to clarify who should be aware. How do we know if they're aware? What level of test of awareness can you have? Access and redress. Very good. Regulators. Okay, we got that in there. We know who should adopt mechanisms that enable questioning and redress. What mechanisms? Can you give me some examples? What would be a good mechanism? What would be a bad mechanism? How do you build these things? Okay. Accountability. Again, good. Legal term. Institutions. Well, I quibbled with that. I don't know what that means. Institution is a little too vague. Should be held responsible, even if it's not feasible to explain how the algorithms produce their results. Should be held responsible. By whom are they held responsible? <coughs> what terms are their responsibility? Is there financial consequences? Can you go to prison for failing to produce an accountable system? Okay. Explanation. Systems and institutions that use algorithmic decision making are encouraged, oh boy, sure they're encouraged <laughs> to produce explanations of procedures and decisions. What does an explanation look like? What kind of explanation? This is heavily discussed in, in the explainable AI and other communities, and I'm looking for more. So again, I want you to take two messages here. I'm very supportive of awareness, access and redress, accountability and explanation. I want to go further. Number five, data provenance. Algorithm builders should maintain a description of how training data is collected. Very good. Very good. Where do they maintain it? What's the format? Is it a machine readable form? Is it open to the public? I mean, how do you know what's acceptable behavior? And each of these decisions has to be made. And you want industry groups like Partnership for AI to begin to take the lead and maybe a, you know, Allen Institute would take the lead in specifying some of these things. Auditability. Models, algorithms, data, and decisions should be recorded so they can be audited. Where are they recorded? Is there a standardized format? Are they machine readable? Who gets to it? What permission do I need to, to get? And then finally, validation and testing. Institutions should use rigorous methods to validate their models. Whose rigorous methods? What rigorous methods? You have an example of good or bad such things. Okay? So that's, that's what we're after. And each one of these has a dozen PhD dissertations waiting for people to come and fill out the blanks about what these ideas mean. And I think it's the questions of our time. So my approach, though, is to go beyond that and to push for all these things through a general process called independent oversight. I became an expert <laughs> on independent oversight about 10 years ago when I was on National Academies panel that was studying for the Department of Homeland Security how to fight terrorism while protecting privacy. What were the trade-offs and how would you provide evidence by which they could choose to use certain machine learning algorithms or not? And which kind of psychological profiling was effective or not? and what degree of privacy invasion. And I, I was the one who wrote the section of this report and studied 40 different forms of, of independent oversight that were in government and in, in corporate versions. And so I've become an advocate of these social processes overlaid. At one point, Oren wrote about the only way to do AI overview, oversight is more AI. He's changed, and I, I think you've moved along. I, I, was I didn't say the only way. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and it's moved forward and very productively in your recent writings about it. Regulating AI are much more constructive in my mind and push things in, in the right direction. So the social processes, I think, are, are particularly valuable. So I built on the notions that I saw and the exemplars of corporate internal audit committees and advisory boards plus external audit. Every publicly listed company in the U.S. is required by the SEC to have an internal audit, okay, and advisory boards, and also have an external audit by one of the large accounting firms and annually produce such a public report with recommendations which have some degree of teeth to them. 
Okay? And that became an important example. External, independent oversight. And what do we mean by independent? How independent is enough independent? Okay, you want to be close enough that you, the people on the review committee know what's happening, but not so close that they're <laughs> in bed with the people who are doing the jobs, okay? So that's important. University accreditations, NSF, EPSRC, all kinds of, we're in the academic world very familiar with independent oversight. We expect independent commentaries on many of the decisions that affect our, our academic life and world. And then zoning boards, planning commissions, environmental impact statements were others, and particularly the federal agencies, NASA has many of them, FAA, FDA, and we'll come to see that. And the particular example that everybody steered me to was the National Transportation Safety Board. This is a unique organization agency within the government. It is supported by Congress, but it is not part of any of the departments because it studies the works of the Department of Transportation, Department of Interior, and other uh, agencies of the federal government. Therefore, its independence is asserted by its budget being controlled by Congress independently of those agencies. And so that allows them to be free. They've come to be a very respected group, which produces reports when there are plane crashes and train crashes and important car crashes or, or, or ship uh, crashes and incidents. And you can read their reports. They're open, they're public, and there's a, a fascinating history, and I'm going to show you from one of those reports. And I'm proposing the idea of a National Algorithms Safety Board. A little twist on that. And I find as I go around speaking about this, people like, you know, they get this. They get this idea. They understand what I'm talking about. And the NTSB has such a positive image and an understandable one that the idea that you would have a team fly in when there's an, you know, been an AI or algorithm failure and study it and write a report and make a recommendation. That's kind of the aspirational goal, okay? Now, we're not talking about academic research projects or startups or research ta think tanks or Allen Institute work. We're talking about if Bank of America says we're going to put out a new mortgage loan system and this is, it's, it's called this, we're going to advertise it heavily and here's the way it's going to roll out, then we'd expect to have that come under some kind of review process. And if there's a failure of that, we might expect an investigation which would have publicly presented uh, visions of, you know, what might be done to improve it. And so um, I built on the models of three aspects of independent oversight. The toughest case is the prospective oversight, which is zoning boards and planning oversight. You're going to build a new building? Great. You appear before the zoning commission and you say, here are my plans to build this building. I have it here to the 3,000 pages of regula regulations about how you build the building, structural strength, electrical, flood, uh, earthquake resistance. For every point in the building, there are two forms of egress within 150 feet. Sometimes these are very specific uh, descriptions. And they evolve over time, and they're agreed on by the community. And the important part is they are enforced by the insurance industry. So you can only get insurance on your building if you've adhered to the building code and you got it passed by the Zoning Commission. There's a maybe adversarial side which says, oh no, oh, your building uh, is too high and will cast shadows that would be damaging on my client clients. Is, is it insurance or building permit? You're getting a building permit, but you can only operate a building, or you, realistic, you can't get insurance on your building unless you... Uh, I believe it's against the law to build without the building permit. Correct, correct. It's insurance. It's against the law well, to okay, build without okay, building. true, true. But those are developed, the refinements of the code are because the insurance company gets involved and they have the data about failures and they say, here are the realistic things, okay? So I think, I'm hoping the insurance company will become our friends in this process. This idea is a tough one to sell. I don't see that in the, in the short term I'm going to get 
AI developers, even from major corporations, to sign up and say, we're, we're ready to do this. Uh, on the other hand, I should say, I find that managers and decision makers and large corporations actually want some kind of rules that allow them to say, I have done the appropriate thing. I've done what's expected from me by my colleagues and by the community. And that's what they're looking for, some set of rules that they can say, I've been, a, I've been ethically correct as a manager, and I've done my job in managing. Whoops. The second form, come on, the second form of regulation is continuous monitoring. So the uh, Federal Reserve Board has an observer at banks, and they continuously monitor how the loans are going, how other aspects are going. The Food and Drug Administration monitors pharmaceutical production and meatpacking and agriculture. And so those are successful strategies. They are expensive, and it takes a long time to put them in place and develop the principles, and they fail occasionally, but there's pretty good evidence that that kind of continuous monitoring is, is effective. Still, I think that's the hard one for me to gain um, early uh, agreement to. Uh, the third is the NTSB, which is retrospective analysis of failure. So the plane crashed, this was Singapore Airlines at San Francisco Airport, and the NTSB shows up within hours, and they're out there taking a look at what's going on. Whoops. So this is the little model. This appeared in that, that paper in PNAS. Planning oversight in advance, continuous monitoring, and then the retrospective. This one is the visible and, and important aspect. Uh, the issues are degree of independence. Does the, does the panel have subpoena power? Can they enforce the recommendations? And so on. So one example of NTSB report of what I'm after, this was the Tesla crash of 2016 where the Tesla ran under the semi-trailer because it was a white se semi-trailer and could not distinguish it from the sky and killed the driver. Um, their report, 65 pages, very readable, very impressive for the detail and the many dimensions they examined this, uh, this crash by. But of their 13 regulations or recommendations, these are the ones that I really liked. Over-reliance on automation and lack of understanding of system limitations by the engineers and designers, okay? They just did not understand what their system was doing or capable of doing under a variety of circumstances. Two, a standardized set of retrievable data is needed to enable independent assessment of automated vehicle safety and foster automation. So I'm a big fan. One of the clean, simple technical things is audit trails, logs, a flight data recorder for every robot a flight data recorder for every algorithm that you capture in detail, and then you have tools to analyze this voluminous log so that you can see what happened. And more importantly, when a disaster occurs, you can replay that disaster, see what happened, and you could say, okay, we've made six changes to our program. Let me replay that and show you that we avoid that disaster. That's the degree I want. That's what's happened in aviation. That's what makes aviation so safe and successful. So the event data recorders are for automated vehicles was another way of their saying it. And as a little bit more, I'll skip that in the, where am I going here? Okay, so just in summary here, to design for safety, clarify responsibility. Okay, that's the issue for me. For me, responsibility is all those six things below it. And the strategies are, to me, in some social process of independent oversight, with open adversarial reviews of those works. Transparency, open the black box. Accountability, open failure reporting. And liability, no hold harmless contracts. I work a lot in me electronic medical records. And you know the companies are very closed about it. So I get doctors who tell me about deadly errors that occur with the use of electronic medical record systems. And I say, could you write that to me in email? And they say, no, I cannot do it. It's, I will lose my job because the contracts from the suppliers of the electronic medical systems prevent the staff from reporting negatively about it. Bill's been in that, okay? Um, so just a little more of the technical things, audit trails and analysis tools like flight data recorders, modular design to support explanation. I think the positive history of debugging tool development shows that you can make it more debuggable by having modular design where you know you have expected values for data that comes across one of those boundaries 
and then you can track it and see that it actually there so you can at least identify where things have gone bad in your process. Visualization tools for understanding algorithms, you might have guessed, and the best work here is Fernanda Viegas at Google, who's shown how visualization not only helps you understand retrospectively what happened, but understand what's going on so as to improve the quality of algorithms as you're writing and developing them. Her TensorFlow work and visualization around that is to me the best example. There are others, and there's a growing community of VizML, visualization for machine learning. Data quality and bias tests for training data. The FATML community is somewhat on this, but Microsoft recently reported on how when they studied real designers, they interviewed 40 of them, they said actually the problem is not with the algorithms there, but it's really the data collection strategies and the quality of the data on the input and how you get the data etc. And so you want to push upstream that study and get real, get past the algorithms and look at the real problems of what, what happens. Benchmark data sets for algorithm validation, um, you know, for testing data sets uh, so you can do regression testing. And did I mention ensuring human control while increasing uh, automation? This is what happens. That's why little cell phones Text messaging has a lot of complexity underneath it, but when I type out a message that says, honey, I'm coming home, that's what I expect gets sent and received on the other end. And the layers of design that allow me as a user to be able to say, I understand what's happening here, I feel in control, and it works. Same thing when I step on the gas pedal, I expect the car to go forward, not the windshield wipers to flip on, because somehow car has figured out that it's raining and it should turn on those windshield wipers, okay? There should be clear consequences of human actions. So the National Algorithm Safety Board is what I'm starting at, and if your goal is safety, then clarify responsibility to improve safety. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm Ryan Kahlo. Um, I am a law professor. Um, I'm the second lawyer in the room, I guess. Um, <laughs> except I'm not even I'm not even barred to practice anymore. So uh, nothing I say is binding uh, is advice to you. And and uh, don't come back to me. Well, you know, Ryan said that I could do this, and and then it turns out not to be true. Um, but I I do think a lot across disciplines. And one of the things I do at the University of Washington is I co-direct the Tech Policy Lab which uh, formally bridges computer <coughs> science, information science, and law, and also involves a host of other departments, um, electrical engineering, communications, even, even urban design, I mean, all kinds of different things. And so, you know, one of my fundamental commitments, and I think the fundamental commitments of the last two speakers and, and of others in the community, is that, you know, you can't solve these problems by reference to any one discipline. You know, these are not the sorts of things that you can just solve in law or solve in ethics or solve in, uh, you know, computer science. Um, but uh, my focus is going to be um, specifically on uh, what policy levers we have available to us and the timing of those levers. And that's why the title of the talk has to do with what should we do right now, what should we do uh, uh, soon, and what should we do one day. Um, so uh, I don't need to remind folks uh, at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence that artificial intelligence is not like one thing, like a train or something like that. You know, it's a, it's a set of techniques um, uh, that can vary pretty dramatically. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it has occasioned a great deal of, of commentary and detractors, as I think Moshe already um, mentioned and, and, and Ben mentioned too, detractors of AI, you know, worry that like, it's going to wake up and kill us, you know, that it's going to be mankind's, humankind's last invention, right? Um, I mean, imagine you're, you're Elon Musk, you, you get up in front of a board, all the governors of every state <coughs> in the union, and you take that time you have with every governor to tell them they're not going to take artificial intelligence seriously enough until the robots start dragging you out of your house and shooting you right, that the AI is going to kill us. Mind you, also imagine the deep irony that that individual built AI that within months actually did kill a person because it failed to detect a white van against the light sky, right? So, you know, there's, there's great stakes here. So the people that talk about 
um, people that respond to the claim that artificial intelligence is going to wake up and kill us often do so by pointing out the truth, which is that it's really early days, that we don't totally understand how it works, that it's broken, that it's held together by this and that, that it involves an immense amount of human uh, input and, and therefore human error. Um, but then those very people who uh, uh, denigrate the, 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 you know, the, the people who are really phobic, um, then turn around and say, but we should immediately apply it to some of our, our most um, sensitive social institutions like criminal justice and health, right? And, and there's a tension there. Um, and I think navigating that tension is uh, very important. Um, so my own view is that, that artificial intelligence as a set of techniques is immensely powerful. It, it, it just, it, 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 um, to use the sort of language of, of James uh, uh, Gibson and later Don Norman, it, it creates a set of affordances that are quite powerful, right? And so I, I think that it could be that it artificial intelligence you know, changes everything. But if it changes everything as you know, both proponents and detractors uh, claim, uh, then one of the things that's got to change is law and legal institutions, right? Otherwise, it's a bunch of bullshit. Let's be honest, right? If, if AI is going to change everything, law and legal institutions are going to have to change with it, or it's just hype, okay? Um, so what should those changes look like? Um, and I think that it's critical, first of all, and I want to associate, yeah? Right, I, I'm getting a little bit lost. Sorry to interrupt, but for example, as I understand it, it took a really long time for our patent laws to appropriately account for software. And even now, many people argue that they don't uh, deal with software appropriately. But nobody is going around saying software is bullshit. So how do you tie change in the legal system, which is slow and cumbersome, with whether the technology is bullshit? So um, let me back up and say, people are saying things like artificial intelligence is a new electricity, right? Um, if you believe that, or if you believe it's like nuclear power, or if you believe it's like the vaccination, or whatever it is you believe, right? Th those things, those transformative technologies created enormous changes in law and legal structures. So has software. Now, yes, patent has been behind. I, I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say that it's not. Um, but like, software has changed law and legal institutions immensely, immensely. And so, I, I, so if, you're, if you want to cherry pick, like, you know, it didn't, it did, software didn't change the law of dog catching either, right? Um, but who cares, right? Patent seems more core, and I appreciate your point. Yeah. Right, so I don't want to derail. No, 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 you're fine. Because this is important. It seems like at the heart of this, and I'm thinking about this for the first time, is this question of kind of what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does the technology race forward? and the law is working as fast as it can <coughs> to catch up, mm -hmm. or do you hold back, rein back the technology because of valid concerns and say, hey, hey, hey. Uh, so what's your model of uh, chicken and egg? Here? Absolutely, and so um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, answer that question by continuing on with the talk that I was prepared <laughs> to give a moment. <laughs> so, okay, so the, the timing is critically important and you can see it like literally from the title that's behind me. Um, there are certain things you do not wanna do prematurely. Okay, and so I am I'm concerned precisely for the reason Oren is beginning to articulate um, with, with interfering too fast, right? The, the, the idea of like defining algorithms, defining artificial intelligence, and then making rules about it, um, that's fraught, right? It's not, no one would say it's not fraught and difficult and complex. And in fact, early errors are evident. So for example, when the state of Nevada, for the first time in state law, defined artificial intelligence at the behest of Google in order to potentiate the driverless cars there, this pioneering law, right? They, they defined artificial intelligence overly broadly and it encompassed a bunch of things that luxury vehicles were already doing like adaptive cruise control and auto lane correction. And so they literally had to repeal the law a year after they passed it and write it over again. Right? So, you know, that's, you know, we can get these things wrong, and especially when it's not <coughs> some artifact like a car, but rather, as I said at the beginning, a set of techniques. So what I would advocate for the first sort of set of things, and I, by the way, I could not agree more, and I've given versions of a talk, um, of a talk to, to folks about this myself, that it can't just be ethics. It can't just be governance. It can't, you know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be policy. It's gotta be law, <coughs> because that's where uh, we go as a society to determine what, what is uh, the truth. I, I, I want to mention um, in that vein, there's a great quote um, by 
uh, Justice uh, Warren, who says that uh, law floats in a sea of ethics, <coughs> which is to say that we need to understand the ethics. We need to have these deep ethical conversations, because otherwise we don't know what the boundaries are. We don't know what's right, what's wrong. But that ethics is not ultimately self-executing, and therefore at some point we need to explain what these rules are going to be. Um, so, so, so I don't think it should be exclusively ethics or, 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 or notions of governance where the decisions are devolved to um, the companies or, or other practitioners as to what to do about it. But in the short term, I think some of the critical things are these. Number one is we need to have greater expertise in government. And we need to have greater expertise in government because a lot of unwise decisions are being made. Um, and I don't, I'm actually quite agnostic <coughs> as to how that takes place. So how, how accruing greater expertise in government takes place. So for example, I have been uh, working with R Street Institute, which is a conservative think tank, about uh, resuscitating the Office of Technology Assessment to help Congress. Um, I've been working with individual agencies with the, uh, the previous administration and the White House and others, trying to talk about where should that expertise reside. I but like FTC just announced some kind of a tech. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, one of, my, one of my students from the Tech Policy Lab is, a tech, is one of the few technologists, devoted technologists at the Federal Trade Commission. One of the missions of the lab is to produce people with that kind of capability. So there yeah. also has been, in recent years, a consistent set of top computer scientists like Felton and people like that. Sure. The FTC, FCC. That's pretty new. In fact. It's all great developments. And, and, you know, one of the conversations we had early on was quite influential to my thinking on this, which is when Ed and others stood up the eScience initiative, um, at University of Washington, which tries to apply data science to a wide range of academic problems, right? Um, even though that has been an incredibly effective, uh, really a national, international model for how to do data science, th they're still, and I hope, correct me if I'm wrong, thinking through whether the correct model is to train everybody a little bit in data science, or to have each particular lab, biology, as, you know, as astronomy, whatever uh, what happens to be, have their own you know, data scientists on, on staff, right? It's, it's, it's not an easy thing to figure out what the most efficient way is to deploy expertise, but it's critically important. And it leads me to a second um, uh, c consideration for now, uh, which is that we have to reform uh, procurement. So much of the early mischief with algorithms affecting people's lives, <coughs> indeed, virtually every example that you have heard, apart from the private examples about consumer privacy, um, uh, and I've given talks about what lessons we can, <coughs> we can learn about, about what happened with consumer privacy and apply them to this situation. A lot of the mischief you're seeing is when government procures something, okay, that it doesn't understand and that it didn't insist upon a measure of accountability and transparency and so on. So for example, the, the, the real tragedy, I think, in many ways for recidivism scores is not that, th it's certainly that they're biased, that's of course um, the, the, the impact that they have, um, but that we can't figure out um, what effect that has had on individual defendants. Um, the individual defendants step forward and say, I have been prejudged by this algorithm. Um, and then when they go to uh, uh, challenge the workings of the algorithm, they're told that, uh, sorry, um, the company that provided it is hiding behind trade secret law, right? Um, and so you don't get this fundamental aspect of due process where you get to figure out exactly how the decision was made about you because of this. Now, c can you imagine, it is an absolute um, travesty that a government would purchase something and not think in the literally in the, in the, in the contract, right? I mean, here these software companies are selling stuff to um, uh, uh, hospitals and they're thinking to, to put in a contract provision that's, that holds them harmless, which hospitals shouldn't have signed, okay? But here you are, the government, procuring things. Not only do you not understand how it works at a technical level, not only have you not insisted on, on various kinds of debiasing measures or best practices, but like literally you didn't anticipate that a defendant would challenge the basis of it. You know, you know what I mean? And so anyway, we have to deeply this reform. This cannot be challenged legally on constitutional well, grounds? Well, that's what is now being litigated in the court. I mean, I AI Now, which is a, a, a group that I'm an advisor for, um, uh, are, are having entire series of workshops with all the people who are litigating against algorithms. 
You know, if you want to read about this, I think still the gold standard <laughs> is Daniel Keats Citrin technological due process. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But I think, and, 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 and for time considerations, I won't say a lot more, but whether you're a state, whether you're a court, whether you're the federal government, whether you're an agency, we need to get so much savvier extremely fast about procurement in, this uni in the United States. Okay, this is just a, just a travesty. So I think one of the things that we should do concretely right now is to make sure that nothing gets purchased without vetting it, vetting it with stakeholders, vetting it in certain ways, insisting on transparency in the literal uh, legal terms and so on. Um, an another thing we can do is, uh, is be strategic about investment. I'm not gonna get into a great deal of detail about that. I was uh, involved in some of the early um, efforts that went into the Obama White House and, and NSF strategy around funding AI research, and I would, would recommend the report that the White House uh, uh, and NSF produced about that. But I think that uh, uh, investing in, in, in research, basic research, interdisciplinary research is also a policy thing that we can do. And then finally, in terms of the right now, uh, and there's so much more to say about all of this, but for the sake of time, um, uh, I, I, I want to say that one of the things we can do right now is we can change the rhetoric, okay? Thank so, the, cha change the rhetoric. Yeah. Change the rhetoric. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking of this rhetoric uh, around AI being a race, okay? That's not good rhetoric. That's ba and or, or, or the even more mysterious notion in the uh, Trump administration executive order about AI that there's something ca that's called American AI. You know what I mean? I mean, this is not only poisonous, but and, and factually ridiculous. If, if you think about how the present day tech firms are running with uh, a, a refinement that occurred, you know, in, 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 in Canada and France, and then calling it American AI, it's absurd. But setting that aside, it leads to bad policy choices. For example, that rhetoric of, Ameri of there being a race or there being an American AI that America has to, has to win uh, leads to, to giving credence to these notions that you should have trade restrictions on your research around machine learning or artificial intelligence. That somehow you can't uh, export something because it's going to have some secret AI in it and you can't give it to some, to some other nation. It leads to ideas about only funding labs if there's Americans in them or Americans as the PI, which would cause at least, <laughs> at least the University of Washington to fall apart. You know what I mean? I mean, we, ha we rely so heavily on uh, these very serious, great researchers uh, from other nations who innovate and, 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 and help the ecosystem. And I'm sure, I'm sure the Allen Institute does too. So this, this, re this rhetoric is very dangerous and very poisonous. The last thing I'll say about it before I go on to the sort of soon is if something is a race, well, then you got to win it, because to the victor goes the spoils, and victors write history, all this different stuff. It's, uh, you can, it, it comes to this idea that you should just innovate at any cost, because you've got to be the winner. And then once you're the winner, then you can figure out everything else. But, but, but really, the important thing is to win. And I think that leads to bad uh, systemic policy issues. Um, the other thing I, I, I would uh, say is that what to do soon. So, that, so if, if what we need to do right now is get better expertise, make wiser procurement decisions, um, uh, invest well, uh, uh, change our rhetoric, then in the, in the soon is we need to tackle some pretty basic problems about um, certification, um, uh, 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 liability, um, <coughs> uh, meaningful human control, the military context, and a few other things. So certification and licensing turns out to be <coughs> a very difficult problem for the law, which is that once upon a time, if you were going to, um, Moshe mentioned, mentioned uh, and I really like that example, that you don't get like an eth ethical certificate for certificate before you drive a car, but you do take a driving test, right? And so it, 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 it just turns out that when you systematically begin to substitute uh, machines for what people did, it, it raises a lot of interesting questions around how do you ensure the adequacy that they're doing the, 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 the task well. So for example, m multiple labs in, in corporate and uh, academia uh, are working on autonomous surgery, right? When you have a surgeon, she's got to like go to medical school and take the boards and, she, you know, and do continuing education. How do you, how do you go about um, 
uh, certifying that a medical uh, an autonomous surgical unit um, is up to the task? Um, and, what, and, and what benchmarks do you use and how do you validate that? There's going to be a whole set of questions that I think look just like that and are not easy. And it's one of the things I think we need to begin to think about now, what constitutes uh, certification and licensing of machines. A criminal and, and, and civil liability, I could go on at enormous length. Some people in this room, bless you, have listened to me go on enormous length about this mm -hmm. issue. But let me just say that the prospect that machines will do things that humans did not anticipate, even if those things are often beneficial. I mean, one of the reasons that it's um, so interesting and good to have these artificial intelligence systems um, is that they, they do things in ways that surprise us. They win at go in ways that no human would have ever anticipated. If the human would have anticipated the strategy, they would have used the strategy. And you see that sort of eerily with, um, for example, the early DeepMind stuff around Atari games. When they started playing Atari, you know, initially like, the, like your, your best friend who was really good at Atari, but then as they iterate more and more and more, they start playing in an inhuman way and they solve problems. That, you know, when that starts to happen, it's usually a good thing. It's a nice thing about emergent technology that it solves problems that are uh, not anticipated by, but it also creates the prospect that it will, that just the systems will just do things people didn't anticipate. How do you hold folks accountable in such a world? Wherein, um, and so, 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 you know, if we, if we think about the prospect, not only that there will be surprising behavior, but that perhaps will have physical consequences, that actually creates some meaningful challenges for the law of negligence, of strict liability, and so on. Um, you know, uh, software is a good example of a place where the law had to innovate around it because um, people, w would, uh, people would buy a computer and it would be built by one company and then they'd have word processing software on there and say they were a professional writer and they were paid by the word and while they're, and while they're writing all of a sudden the system would crash and usually if you bought something that like, cost you a lot of money by not working the way it would, you can sue over it, but the courts uh, quickly domesticated the problem of liability for software where there wasn't a physical injury uh, by creating some rather interesting sort of um, uh, ideas around warranty uh, and economic loss. Uh, but when you reintroduce the physicality of that, where it's software that can touch you and therefore hurt you, uh, those, those things will have to be balanced, rebalanced and changed. Um, I am not deeply expert in the military context. I should be very, very clear. But I think that something we need to do soon is be um, very concrete about autonomy in lethal weapons. And the current conversation is, is revolving around this idea of, of meaningful human control. That is to say, there shouldn't be lethal weapons that, where someone doesn't have meaningful human control. But we have yet to fill out the exact contours of that. And I think that's a problem. And I think it needs to be addressed immediately. Um, you know, there are active campaigns like Stop Killer Robots. Speaking of rhetoric, I'm not so thrilled about their rhetoric. Um, but you know, th th what they're really pushing us to is you know, we're at a moment, a decision moment here. And we've got to figure out what we're going to allow and what we're not going to allow. And that's, that's, that's really a, an, a, a thing for soon, if not, if not um, immediately. And, um, uh, and, and also, we need uh, new models for some of the issues that have already come up. We need new models for privacy, for example in the near term. Why? Well, wi without getting into too much detail about privacy uh, uh, because of, of time constraints, one of the, um, one of the facets of, of privacy is that it makes a dichotomy between information that you voluntarily give up and information that you want to keep private. And so privacy law will tend to say that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy in public. And it will tend to say that you don't have expectations of privacy and things that you post online willfully or whatever it happens to be. You know, anything that's public, anything you share voluntarily. Well, one thing we know about the set of techniques that are artificial intelligence is that many of them are, are incredibly capable of pattern mm -hmm. recognition. And that means in turn that they're increasingly able to derive the intimate from the available. And there will be a breakdown more and more. And I think the Supreme Court is beginning to understand this, beginning to realize this in a series of decisions. There's going to be a breakdown more and more between these notions of things that you just voluntarily shared and things you didn't want people to know about you because the things that you voluntarily share, shared will tell the right people 
you know, or the wrong people, things you don't want them to know about you, right? Um, and that, that is a collapse. Another one is we need new models for discrimination. I mean, there's great work being done by folks like Solon Barakas and Andrew Selps around the adequacy of notions of disparate impact, uh, given, the, given the way in which these algorithms uh, tend to have these uh, dis disproportionate impacts. Um, and so uh, without getting through an exhaustive list, um, in the near term, the law is going to have to grapple with these new affordances and to try to figure out um, uh, what to do about it. Another one is, and we began to talk about this, new models of due process. Because, um, you know, it turns out that if there's been a deprivation by the government of life, liberty, or property, um, you're entitled to certain kinds of process before that occurs. And that process is often frustrated when we bring in algorithmic and other kinds of um, artificially intelligent tools um, into, into the mix. Um, both because of, of the, the trade secret problem, which people like Rebecca Wexler have <coughs> written about extensively, uh, but also just for basic reasons like the officials themselves don't understand how something works or um, uh, 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 maybe even it is a black box, you know. Um, well, by the way, to Moshe's point, I, I, don't, I, I just mentioned this briefly. Um, one of the interesting things about the example about the, the fluffy, was it, you know, making a decision? Um, you know, th there's, le there's levels of inscrutability. So, like, when you explain to somebody with a straight face, how did fluffy determine that this person, right, was a recidivist? Um, you're going to describe the process and you're going to say something like, well, snuff <laughs> Fluffy went over and sniffed them, and every time that they sniff someone as a recidivist, Fluffy barks twice. And that's going to strike everybody as ridiculous, right? But these systems are, can be sometimes explained at a, a more plausible level of generality. You know what I mean? We took a bunch of people like this individual. We extracted certain features. We, you know what I mean? You, in theory, you could explain. If you, even though you can't explain precisely what went on in the inner logics, you can describe a process that sounds plausible, right? And so you know, we need to work out precisely what those processes are um, and so on. Um, so, so there's a lot more, of course. But you know, I just want to just point out that, that figuring these things out are pressing. They need to happen soon. They won't happen immediately. They're more likely to happen as we get a better understanding of these sets of tools, and we, they're more li likely to happen as we get a better sense of our own ethical compass around them. Again, you don't want to make policy, you don't want to make laws without having a notion about what is right and what is wrong. Um, but delaying too long, of course, will leave uh, people um, uh, uh, without, um, without uh, the process that they're due and, 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 and will lead to harm, particularly of vulnerable populations. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and then I, I, I want to reserve time for, for Q&A, um, is, uh, is what should we do eventually? So eventually could mean a quite a long time horizon. Uh, a couple things I do want to dramatize for you, though, are that, um, you know, uh, well if ever we come to a place where this artificial intelligence is actually substituting for people in a way that's meaningful, that we actually think of the AI like people, that they're just like people, but they're just machines, um, that's going to break everything because there are so many fundamental biological assumptions in the law. So just a very quick example is, imagine that there's some AI that says, you know, <coughs> like so many Democrats, I want to run for, for president. I want to, you know, be president of the United States. And uh, I'm, 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 I know a lot, and I'm really good, and, I, you know, and, and I'm, make, I'm really a great decision maker, um, and I, I'm ready. And, and say we believe that it's conscious and actually might be a good president. Does the, 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 does the fact that they were built last year, <laughs> does the fact that they were built last year mean, mean that they have to wait for 35 years before they run for president, right? There are so many assumptions like that built into the law that if ever we were to like say there was a this non- would be an example, we need American AI. Only American AI. That's true, and would, uh, that's right. That is a great example. That's a place where American AI would, it, 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 precisely right. We need the long form of the birth of the Yes, that's right, that's right. Um, I, I think that you were maybe made in, in, in Kenya or maybe made in, you know, exactly. Um, it, that, that's right, and, and so, and so the, you know, it just, it just, there's so many fundamental, we'd have to unpack those things. Um, 
But that said, short of that, you might imagine legal status of some kind for some kinds of systems. And those are things I think we will need to work out in the long term. Systems that have been created uh, as works of art, um, as legal instruments, as instruments of change, uh, that we somehow would want to respect their legal uh, abilities. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll open it up for questions, is you know, I think at some point, because this is truly potentially a transformative set of affordances, I think that AI can be an, invita an invitation for us to take a pretty deep inventory of our own values and see if perhaps those values might be um, uh, uh, better achieved or actually achieved, but we can actually fulfill some promises that we've made. For example, while I certainly do not believe we should be replacing judges with AI, and I think that's kind of incoherent when people talk about that. Um, there are so many ways we could use the tools that we have to improve the justice system so that perhaps you can get an actual speedy trial like the Constitution guarantees, right? I mean, today, you have to wait a year before you even get into the ballpark of being able to say, I didn't have a speedy trial. That shouldn't be supportable, and it's less and less supportable as our tools become better and more efficient, okay? Or, you know, I can't get, uh, the, the courts are clogged because we can't find interpreters. Meanwhile, machine learning interpretation is getting really, really good, right? So I think we need to take inventory of our values and, and, and make sure we know how to use these tools. Um, so with that, uh, because of time considerations, I'm going to end here and say thanks and ask if you have any questions, which you do. Yeah. No, sir. spend a minute, and I literally mean a minute, thinking about what approach you're going to take it when you approach these big hairy problems. And I like to use knowability. I, I'm not going to get into the paradox. It's, it's on the left there, expressed mathematically straight out of Wikipedia for anybody who wants to look it up. Um, I like Donald Rumsfeld's version better, which is on the right. Uh, there are going to be things that we don't know that we don't know. and much like with cars and with airplanes, there's a really high probability that people will die because of that. And that is the cost of the technology. It's not a desired outcome. But I also refuse to believe, and I work at tech companies, so this is saying something, I refuse to believe that there are nefarious people sitting around in basements trying to come up with ways to deliberately manipulate and harm society. It's happening accidentally. And it's happening because we're not thinking about it or talking about it. And in this day and age, particularly in America, we're really not talking to people who we disagree with or who disagree with us. So that's where no ability comes in, is we need to accept that at least a good 25% of the time, something bad is going to happen. That's just it. So what can we do? Well, computer science and engineering have come up with really good models for this already. And the first one is fault tree, which I'm sure everybody in here is very familiar with in detail. But in case you aren't, I'll talk about them a little bit in turn. Failure model, this is a, a very detailed workflow of ordering a pizza. Each step that happens along the way, including my favorite part, which is where the customer calls to complain that the pizza is late and you have to calm them down, which is that little green <laughs> bubble there. Um, these are used a lot in privacy and in other subjects that involve data flows because it's a way to map out where does the data go and who has access to it. The other one talks about what are all the things that can go wrong and let's work backwards from there to see how we can fix or remediate that. And I feel like that's where most of this conversation, not just today, but generally in the field, rests. Because the horror stories are pretty awful. You know, we're hearing about bias, we're hearing about predictive policing, we're hearing about racial discrimination, automated facial recognition systems being used to make decisions that are simply layered on top of the biases that already exist in society, and it goes on and on and on. So, Again, going back to knowability, some horrible stuff's going to happen. So the ones we know, we can begin to talk about and address. But what does that look like? And we've talked a lot today about who should own this. There was even mention of a, a chief ethics officer role. Um, I would propose this instead. I would propose this largely because 
I started my career 20 some odd years ago in privacy, and at that time there was a huge push that led to the creation of chief privacy officer roles, CPOs, right? You see them everywhere now. It's fairly common. What it did, effectively, was abstract everyone else in the company from having to worry about privacy because it was that guy's problem. So we want to make a new mistake. So I feel that the new mistake could be better set by the distribution of ethics. So loosely what I've put together here is HR, engineering slash product management, and sales all being responsible for different aspects of the development of technology in a given company. Sales, marketing, customer service, whatever you want to call them, they're the logical people to find out what the actual <coughs> customer's intended use is. So we're going to sell them something, we might bind it, it might have good intention, but then it turns out that they're going to take it and do something else with it. And if you ask a salesperson to answer that question, they can. They may not have data to back it up, but they will tell you right away whether the customer they're dealing with is creepy or not. They will tell you based on their experience whether they're going to go and take this and do something else to it and then make lots of money over here and it's going to bounce back on us. They can tell you that. So let's use that information and those experiences. When we talk about HR, I don't know why we would talk about ethics in any other context in a tech company except for HR. Now, I'm not one to defend them. I've spent a lot of time dealing with HR and there is always the position that they're there for the best interest of the company as opposed to the employee. So once again, not presenting a perfect solution. But I am saying there's an apparatus and resources and people who are already set up to deal with sticky ethical questions, organizational psychology questions, questions of how to make decisions, questions of the chilling effect of whistleblowing, so why not leverage them? They can be just as easily a point of contact for somebody who is concerned about the ethical implications of the work they're doing or a project they're on. Um, one example I heard about recently in a company I was working with was somebody who desperately did not want to work on government contracts because they would be required to get security clearance from the US government, which would mean that when they went home to Iran, they would be flagged in the system and they may not be able to enter the country again. Now, that's a great ethical question. It needs to be addressed by all sorts of the mechanisms that everybody talked about today. But the primary concern is the person who wants to go home for Christmas, right? It's not the person who needs to change what the entire infrastructure around geopolitical awareness is. We just need to figure out how to get them on a project that they can still contribute, still work on, and the product doesn't suffer. Then we have engineering and product management. We've talked a lot today about the role of engineers, about policy around regulation, and it's kind of been at odds with a lot of the conversations I have with engineers. And a lot of them are asking questions like, yeah, I know there's a problem, and you want me to do what about it? How do I fix it? What am I supposed to think about? How am I supposed to think about those things? And what are the tools that I can use to help me get a concrete answer? Because that's part of the problem. If you put lawyers and engineers and salespeople and product in the same room, you'll have a great conversation. You absolutely will. But your engineer might get a little frustrated, as I have seen happen repeatedly, because they ultimately want an answer. And that's what a lot of this workflow is about. How do we create those answers? The other piece for a company is talking about basic communications. And I put this all under the bucket of transparency because I think it's the same thing. We've seen Google talk about their AI principles. Other companies are throwing out AI principles like they're going out of style. Everybody's got five or six or nine. There's some really interesting PhD dissertation in the number of AI principles that you choose. I know there are. Um, you need a whistleblower policy, but that's a legal requirement. Like, you should have one anyway. You need to talk about program updates in your cycle the same way you would with anything else. There doesn't need to be some sort of special ethics board per se. You can roll all of that into your day-to-day -day business, and that's really the ideal answer because everybody's responsible for this stuff. So what does it actually look like? Well, I've 
batted around a couple of different ways to say, yes, we need an ethical review, and no, we don't, because that's really the first question, right? New engineering work's being requested. How do you determine whether that engineering work requires an ethical review or not? And there's a bunch of different criteria. These are the four that I have come up with. Again, not perfect. Needs to be iterative. Also, some of them don't apply to different companies, depending on the work they're doing. But this is a good place to start. So first of all, is this something brand new that you're building? Or does it already exist? The reason this matters is because if it's brand new, at the end of the day, you have no idea what's going to happen to it when you put it out in the wild. So you're really going to want to pay more attention to it. If you've already got something out there and you're just doing something fancy or new to it, then maybe there's less risk and you could argue that you don't need to do another review. Purpose and use comes into play here, and this is definitely a judgment call. You want to know if and be able to make an evaluation that, and this is where your lawyer and your product manager comes in, that there are in fact technical and legal restrictions on the use of that product before you sell it or release it. If you can do that, if you can guarantee that, then maybe you don't need an ethical review. Maybe you can constrain what the product can do and you're very aware of what the limitations are and have communicated that already. However, if you're not, or you've got some technical controls on something, but you're not sure that they can't be hacked, then you're going to want to take a look at it. The other piece that you need to think about at this stage is what's the deployment like? Is it just going out into the wild, period? Anybody can use it? I give you Tay as a good example. Did anybody interact with Tay way back in the day? Tay was released for exactly eight, ten hours, I think, before it went rogue. Um, but a perfect example, like Tay went out because it was an experiment. It was a little research project. It was somebody sitting around saying, this will be interesting, let's see what happens. And that's exactly the situation where you want somebody else sitting in a room saying, maybe we should talk about that. Reasonable person test. This is a very common test anywhere outside of the United States. This is actually used for privacy enforcement law in most of what used to be known as the British Commonwealth and is very common in the EU. And it basically asks one very simple question. Would a reasonable person expect this to happen? Not an engineer. Not an expert. Not reasonable people. <laughs> I'm not touching that. That's a whole other session. <laughs> Not a lawyer, not somebody who works in this field, but the person that I always picked was my grandmother. Now, I picked her because she's a chemical engineer, okay? Because the idea here isn't to pick someone dumb. That's not the point. The point is to pick somebody who doesn't have expertise in the field that you're talking about. It's to break the filter bubble. It's to say, what does somebody outside of this room think about this? And if you think about this question, it's actually really easy to answer nine times out of ten. All you have to do is try to explain your problem to someone else, someone you don't work with. This is why it's important to have friends who aren't in the same field that you are. The next criteria, scope and scale. This part matters because if there's a way to restrict the scope, or they restrict the use. It's going to one company, one team, one department, one group, and it's not being used anywhere else. You could argue that perhaps the implications of that technology won't be as broad and won't necessarily require you to do extra work. It's debatable, right? That's sketchy because there's a lot of really limited and specific circumstances that are quite dangerous, particularly for vulnerable people. But again, not a perfect tool. Last, I propose likelihood of harm, and I have a question mark here for all the reasons that we've talked about already today, because the definition of harm from a legal perspective is incredibly narrow. It's about financial harm, economic harm, physical harm. Are you going to get punched in the face by the algorithm? Probably not. But there's a whole other kind of harm that happens here. And so I threw in the words facilitate injury as well. Because injury is a bigger thing. Injury is a broader concept. And again, you don't want the lawyer defining these questions or these terms. You just want to have the conversation. So say you put all those things together. Say all four of them come back as, yep, this is a new technology. We failed the reasonable person test. 
we don't really know what's going to happen with this product, and it's definitely going to be widespread, which, frankly, if you're throwing something out the door that's like this, you probably shouldn't in the first place. But you could say, okay, for sure, we require a review. <coughs> Conversely, you could say that the lower risk would be if all of those answers were no. But the truth is, it's probably going to be something more like this, and it's going to depend on what your organization wants to do. So in this case, <coughs> two criteria are low risk, two criteria are high risk. So do you do a review or not? Most organizations will intrinsically have the answer to this question already, because you know whether you work at a place that tolerates risk or doesn't tolerate risk. It's really not a hard thing to figure out. But if you put this bucket over here and say, oh, we're talking about ethics, then everything becomes opaque. What you need to talk about is, what's the tolerance, period, for risk? Ethical risk, ethical obligation is just another aspect of that. So you need to embed it. All right, given that, how do you actually activate it? This is the criteria we propose that I've been testing now for about a year. You will notice a substantial lack of definitions and precision. <coughs> that is on purpose. And I will give you one example why. I spent 20 some odd years in the privacy domain specifically, talking to people who are doing things with data and nothing else. Every single conversation for 20 years centered on what do you mean by privacy? Is this data point personal information in our specific <coughs> geographic region. Those are futile and useless conversations. Okay? It's kind of like when Bill Clinton decided to hold up the hearing by wondering what the definition of is is. Right? It's the same thing. Like, it doesn't matter. And it really, really doesn't matter when you talk about ethics. Because we all know what these things are. The inability of us to articulate our vision precisely to someone else does not preclude you from being an ethical person. We all act ethically every single day, because if we don't, there are immediate social consequences. We all know that. Ever cut somebody off in traffic? They honk at you. It's a social consequence. <clears throat> the problem is, algorithms don't have that. There's no context for them. They don't get punished that way. So instead of having conversations about definitions, we need to have a conversation about what the outcome is. Privacy. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? I have no idea, and I have my PhD in it. What I do know is if I try to open a bathroom door when someone else is in it, I get an immediate and visceral response. And it is a protecting privacy response. That's all we have to create here, and that's really not that hard. So you sit in a room and you have this conversation. And the surprising part is it doesn't take that long. Because it's actually pretty easy to buzz through these questions and talk about them in a certain context when you have a specific scenario or product in mind. To talk about them abstractly is the work of moral philosophers. Harms is the same thing. The Future of Privacy Forum came out with this list. Um, the FTC was looking to expand what their notion of harm was. And FPF said, these are the categories we should consider. They went down further and divided them up by what are individual examples of these harms, what are social examples of these harms. They have a great chart if you need one <coughs> online. It's really useful. Who did, who did this? Future Privacy Forum. It's an advocacy group. And <coughs> the entire basis for this is to capture things that weren't captured here. So you evaluate your product, but then perhaps you miss something, so you have a quick five minute conversation in that same meeting about, okay, so any loss of opportunities as a result of this thing? Any potential financial harm? <coughs> any chance that somebody could experience some sort of social consequences? Any chance that somebody could be wrongfully imprisoned or lose their liberty in some other way? Again, big words, no definitions. Because it doesn't matter what they mean. We all know already. So let's take an example. Here's a list of use cases that we have at Axon for facial recognition. These use cases are iterative, and they start with both positive and negative examples. So while everybody is very concerned about automated facial recognition and decisions being made with policing in this manner, I actually think we could talk about one that's possibly a little bit more positive. One example is this one, kidnapping victim. 
So an officer has a facial recognition camera mounted on their chest. They're doing a routine stop. They've received consent from the family of the kidnapped person to include that photograph in the database. They pull over this routine stop and the camera flags that that person is in the back seat. Perfectly reasonable use of the technology. And again, I'm right there along with you. I like the black mirror interpretations of this stuff. But if we keep talking only about those, all of these uses get lost as well. So in this case, we talk about what's the motivation, what's the scenario, what's the specific example. Because if we just talk about automated facial recognition, tons of red flags go up. But what about in this case, when it's about finding the seven-year-old kid that's been kidnapped? So how do we apply the criteria? Well, precisely as I said, a group of us get on the phone. One engineer, one product manager, one salesperson, a couple of people from the community, me for privacy, whatever that means, <laughs> and a couple of other people from policing advocacy groups. And we walk through this scenario, and we take notes. I did actually take these notes, so they're slightly um, incoherent. But we walk through each criteria, and we talk about what's the pro, what's the con, and then is there an ancillary consideration we need to think about. And in the course of that conversation, that use case took 40 minutes to discuss, we changed the product spec, we built in some additional controls, and we talked about all of these issues. We didn't resolve them. Right? We're well aware that there's a huge potential for misuse here because in law enforcement it is possible to have a guardianship relationship. So somebody could enroll you in this program for being part of this automated facial recognition software when you're trying to run away from a really legitimate situation. But is automated facial recognition the tool to solve that problem? Maybe, but I don't think so. I think it's a social problem. And I think what we're seeing is that the technology is just aggravating all of those problems and making them very prominent. And that's a good thing. So what do we do next? Well, I think the first thing we have to think about is this workflow works if you have a product already, even if you're thinking about something. But what if you're just sitting at your desk thinking about new and interesting things to do? What if you're just researching? That I don't have an answer for yet, but I suspect it's something similar a set list of criteria, a conversation with somebody other than yourself or your colleagues. There's some answer in here, and we will find it. I think it starts with this notion. Again, my privacy roots are showing. Um, it used to be that there was me, my stuff, and my data, and we all sat in different pockets. That doesn't work anymore. It's me, it's my stuff, it's my data, it's all intertwined. And then there's people making additional data sets about me based on my observation and interaction with my stuff. And then of course, because privacy is transitional, anything all of you do impacts my privacy as well. So we have to represent that and think about what the model is for that. Right now, the best way to do that is to look at what research is already doing. And luckily enough, Human subject research has already had a lot of work done in this space, and it started with the Nuremberg Code, and most recently ended up with the Belmont Report, which has some really good, practical, useful suggestions for how to manage human subjects in research. Because when we're talking about algorithms and AI, that's all we're talking about. It's just another form of human subject research, a sexy one, a fancier one, but all of the engineers who are building these products are doing human subject research because they're using our data. So what did the National Institute of Justice say? Well, they set out these principles. And I think these read a lot like evaluation criteria. And I think they could be implemented the exact same way. I haven't tested it yet. But my guess is, if you stuck to something along these lines, as a researcher in AI, you would probably be able to come up with a similar table that would inform your work and help you figure out how to design things in a safe way. So, concluding thoughts. These are not them. I put these on the slide before I heard everybody present today, and I think these have been well covered. Cooperation with government, engagement in policy, training and legal responsibilities, yada yada, motherhood, apple pie, it's all the same. That's great. We're not going to argue with any of it. What do the actual concluding thoughts of all this work mean? Well, number one, 
Lawyers, doctors, and architects, what do they have in common? They're all professionally regulated by themselves, right? If you commit malpractice as a doctor, somebody can appeal to a board, take your license away, and you will be evaluated by a group of your peers. I'm sorry, engineers, but you're in the same bucket. And all of you need to be professionally regulated, too. And it isn't just for ethical concerns. It's for all the other subjects we touched on today. The second piece, and I think this is really important to consider, is that the monopolistic creation of technology companies is what is aggravating this problem. Data sharing is going on at a level that I guarantee you is way worse than any of you could possibly imagine. There are not barriers and boundaries between all of these companies that we think there are. They're all sharing all kinds of data all the time and selling it and exchanging it and all of that is happening because there hasn't been a DOJ investigation like happened against Microsoft in the 90s. These companies need to be broken up. This is what size gets you. End of story. Questions? <laughs> Try to moderate a little bit because we have so limited time. But let's start with the audience and with where should we be in three years realistically? Yes. Um, I mean, so so one common theme that I noticed in all three of the talks is that the existing incentives appear to be perverse, and they appear to be perverse in pretty irreconcilable ways, like shareholder value that Moshi mentioned in the first talk. Um, so all three of the solutions seem to involve dramatic changes to our current capitalist technical system. Um, so it seems like in three years we need some revolutionary institutional or economic change. Um, seems to be. Uh, that's the worst thing I had all day. And I actually uh, <laughs> did dis disagree. But, it, but anybody? Uh, no, I, I, I disagree with you. I mean, we can debate separately whether we need it or not. But t take, for example, the point that was mentioned about uh, that big tech is too big. This, this, we, we have a long tradition in, in going back to the beginning of the 20th century, looking at, at corporations, and corporation, unlike what some people think that the free market is a, is a natural construct, it's a societal construct. I mean, the modern uh, limited liability corporation goes back, I believe, I'm not an expert, uh, early uh, 19th century. And so, over the years, we have revised society, it's a contract, it's something we have, we have, we have between society and allowing a group of people to form a corporation. And we have changed the definition, what is allowed, what is not allowed. So antitrust goes back to the early 20th century, and you have big, you know, what is it? Theodore Roosevelt fighting against some of these big corporations. Some of, some of the law were determined by like harm to consumers. They may be less applicable now, because the products are free, so it's not exactly clear. But it doesn't mean we cannot change and we cannot apply antitrust law either existing within, in, with a more modern interpretation, or if we do, we can revise them to address it. This, this does not change capitalism, okay? A corporation always works against legal constraints. They always optimize, let's put it, they optimize against legal constraints. That's, if you want, that's the definition of capitalism. Changing legal constraints is not changing capitalism, okay? Changing the, the, the tax law to make sure that Amazon pays some taxes. That's not abolishing capitalism. That's, that's, that's fine-tuning, I would call it fine-tuning capitalism. Now, I'm, this is a separate discussion whether we should or should not change capitalism, and this country may be ready for it, but I don't think that what we said says we need to abolish capitalism. It's not necessary. So, uh, sorry, tr yeah. Tracy was Oh, sure, I can give you a short answer. I totally agree. Yeah, I think we need to scrap the whole thing and start all over. <laughs> <laughs> That's my short answer. You, but, you, can, know, go, you can go with hell or with me. My Canadian is showing. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think all we're seeing with the advent of, of technology and infrastructure being invented in every social institution that we have and in every kind of um, service that we offer is how very flawed they all are and how very much we need to redesign all of it and start over. I mean, the world isn't what it used to be, right? We're 7 billion people and counting with imminent threats of climate change, and, you know, things are not working, so, yeah. I'm appropriately in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do think, that, you know, changes are needed. I think it's possible. I, you know, I'm the optimist. Uh, there'll be people who resist, but I tend to work with the people who are with me. So I am looking for the people in 
the AI and the algorithms in the business world and looking for the people in the government who want to find a way forward. There's a long positive history of voluntary industry standards, regulations, developments that benefit the industry. I think the clear thing is that things benefit. Whether, you know, automobiles that have the brake pedal on one side and the gas pedal on the other side took a long time. But there's a general agreement that when you have those kind of consistencies, now you can have a rental car market. Now you can, you know, have economies of scale. And there's all kinds of ways that I think thoughtful business leaders come to understand as we get past the sort of Wild West frontier thinking of, you know, AI, let me do, or algorithms, let me do what I want, or even software engineering, let me do what I want, uh, don't tread on me, it's time to get on to a more civilizing state where we're going to have these, you know, real benefits and safety. So we'll go on to the next questions. Please don't feel uh, everybody has to answer each question, uh, even though opinions are different, but please, uh, yes. Well, I'm, it's just kind of focused for Ben, but I'd be interested in what anybody thinks. So if we do a we have a board that oversees AI, and a lot of AI is really just regression. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, Can we quote you on that? <laughs> sure. sure. Uh, you know, uh, uh, where do you where where do you draw the line? Where does the ghost get into the machine, and all of a sudden it's AI instead of basic statistical decision making? Oh, but you know that's why I chose the term algorithm. It's not AI. Okay, good. So, so, so that helps. You know, okay. And now you know now so, the so, issue. And the boundary will be what are consequential algorithms, okay? So okay, good. if you're going to build a little treehouse for your kids in the backyard, you do not need to appear sure. to the Zoning Commission, okay? Uh, <laughs> well, actually, it's <laughs> yeah, that's a separate story. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's going to be places where we come to agree these are larger, substantial, <coughs> and, and, you know, uh, Kathy O'Neill's opacity, scale, and harm are reasonable uh, ways to help make that boundary. And again, I think there are deep institutions in the society, again, insurance companies, but also regulatory uh, bodies that exist already, and then certification bodies and professional societies. And I, I, I hope that we can create a movement which is pro-social that pushes for these positives. So, so just to pin you on it, you, you would then have this board apply to sort of pen and paper. Uh, they, they would govern the use of pen and paper algorithms if they were algorithms so simple. No. No. If they were because opaque, scalable, if they were, if they were opaque, they're not, they're not scalable, scalable, and they're not, you know, producing harm. You have criteria. I think the, the key point, which I very much agree with Ben with, is AI is really just the next step in software. I'm going ignore mm -hmm. the software hardware yeah. thing, right? So both a lot of the goods associated with software and a lot of the bad, for example, you know, job displacement and so on. These things have been going on for, for decades, and we, we do need you know, to monitor the software that you know, deals with bridges and nuclear power plants, yeah. whether there's AI in it or not. Thanks. I just, I just want to understand a little bit clearer on, on this point. So right now, uh, you know, there's this institution, Y Combinator, which launches startups, and they're about to launch a batch of 100 startups that have been hacking away for the past few months, many of which are involving algorithms and trying to solve large-scale problems. So is the proposition that uh, you know, these hundred <coughs> startups, which are two people each in a, in a room somewhere, they should all be appearing before a board to ask no. for permission? No, I said explicitly, startups, no. They don't have scale, okay? Until they reach something where they have scale and impact and harm, they're okay. A lot of regulations only apply. I said that. I mean, that's yeah. really, yeah. just yeah. want to be real clear that you, if a startup and university research and things like that are all fine, but there's a difference where to draw the line right between them, a startup, and Bank of America putting a hundred programmers to work and developing a mortgage program that will affect tens of millions of people, right? I, I think that's where you and I are both clear. Whatever the solution is, there has to be criteria yeah. before you're subjected. But, but there are startups there who are, we're going to disrupt the mortgage industry and we're going to be, we're going to beat Bank of America with yeah. the And at a certain well, point, when they get there. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know. so where do you go? So you want to? I'd rather cherry pick the top ones and say let's work on. For me, medical record systems. Okay, yeah. there's something that scale that already has widespread use, which is a concentrated industry. Epic is now a majority, you know, controller, but a t totally closed company. And you know, those are, that's a place I want to start. With. Here we go. So I'm just interested in examples of approaches that have worked and not worked in the past. Uh, aviation seems like an interesting example where things are almost absurdly safe. You know, somehow we got to this point where zero fatalities is the only acceptable 
uh, outcome. And I'm curious how we got to that point. By contrast, the sort of 2008 financial crisis seemed like a case where we assumed the insurance agencies would provide the bulwark against failure, yeah. and they somehow didn't. Now, maybe there's more things happening as well. Not so much insurance, but the ratings agents. Yeah, both. Yeah, right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, the story about aviation safety is pretty compelling. I think it's really a wonderful <laughs> model. Charles Perrault, Normal Accidents, is my favorite reading on the history of safe industries. Uh, he's a Yale sociologist, now retired, but his book, it's kind of old, but still, I think, the best one, Normal Accidents, just talks about, I mean, simple things. The software companies that have a one-page list of the common bugs in their organization, and, you know, the frequency, they're better, okay? You know, <laughs> there's some simple things that uh, these kind of processes uh, produce a safe culture. FAA is famous for a lot of things because it's open and reporting. There's an FAA website where if you're an air traffic controller or a pilot or someone who sees something that's wrong, you can report it online and then your personal liability is, is removed because, you know, it is an open reporting scheme. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reports and analyses of the FAA are generally open, like the NTSB. I, I, one of the few things I come to see more often than not <laughs> is a good thing is openness. Sunlight, you know, is the disinfectant. Mm -hmm. but, but to go back to your question, I think society has somehow, how we, how we handle risk and accidents is not a simple model, okay? Right. One thing happened with, with the, the, the air traffic industry is when accident happens, lots of people die at the same time. And that shakes us. On the other hand, so 200 people die in one plane crash, we are shaken. Okay, on the other hand, we can calculate about 30,000 people die uh, every year. So every day, a few hundred people get killed in car accidents. That's the cost of doing business. So somehow, you know, it's not a linear system. I mean, it's a complicated system. There is a good question. How much would we expect autonomous vehicles to be safer than human drivers? Right. If you utilitarian, you say, well, if we cut the accident rate by 10%, that's already great. <clears throat> On the other hand, we saw how people react. We are very tolerant towards human errors, are very intolerant towards machine errors. Mm -hmm. So Amnon Shashua, who is the founder of uh, Mobileye, which Intel ultimately has bought, that's a part in that uh, start, Israeli startup in that space, Intel pays $16 billion, I'm assuming it's a worthwhile uh, <laughs> uh, startup. And he wrote an article, he said, he thinks it's going to, the society will expect autonomous vehicle to be a thousand times safer than human drivers. We can debate whether it's a thousand or a hundred, but it's very clear we expect it to be dramatically safer. Why? Because. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, one solution to, to that is to, which is, was actually uh, Amnon's solution, right, was to approach these things more incrementally. So rather than, okay, here's a safe autonomous vehicle, you start with golf carts that deliver the groceries at less than 25 miles an hour. You start with safety devices like the mobile eye uh, devices that give you warnings, and over time, you become increasingly reliant. So in, you know, 2019 vehicles, there are all kinds of AI, quote unquote, based safety devices that help you know when to not change lanes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that there are paths that will get us there before we're a thousand so, times. So my, my pitch for the HCI side is that the design of those things make a huge difference, and the naming and the presentation. So it's called cruise control, not automated driver, not driverless, or not autonomous. Those words corrupt the thinking of the engineers who design those things. When you shift to a model that says cruise control, active parking assist, that's Mercedes-Benz name, then you're talking about a different design, not just that it presents a different image, but the design is different, giving the user a greater sense of control, predictability, and comprehensibility. Those there, are the there is some criticism of, of, of uh, Google via uh, now Waymo, that by establishing that the only worthwhile goal is autonomous vehicle, driverless vehicles, and uh, now, first of all, everybody realizes it's maybe been a bridge too far. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit, some people say, oh, in five years is going to happen. Now, well, maybe 25, That's maybe 50, right. it's a bit more difficult they've than They've shot themselves, they've hurt themselves yeah. by that. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I, I like Ben's point about use of language. I mean, just the fact that Tesla chose to name its product Autopilot, what does that say about their Good. corporate culture? Good. And, Good. you know, I've done a lot of thinking about the Tesla accident, and I'm wondering whether 
Tesla in the end might just be a, a blip. And the reason I'm saying that is because we're a couple of years away from BMW, Mercedes, Benz, Audi, other premium car manufacturers having equivalent products, mm -hmm. but they're coming from a tradition of safety mm -hmm. as opposed to innovation. And how long can Tesla stand up when they have the re building the reputation they have, and you have these comparable products coming from a from the safety Thank manufacturers? You. I just wanted to come briefly to the defense of Google, and it, I I agree that they botched the language, okay, but but the notion is that humans are incapable of assuming <coughs> control, it's gathering absolutely. content, and that that was demonstrated by hundreds of thousands of miles of their driving. So I think. You know, if you think of there being five levels of autonomy, what they've said is forget some of those intermediate levels, right? Um, I, I, Oren has often drawn the distinction between automation and autonomy, and I think that's maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but very useful. Okay, you don't worry about your automatic transmission. It, it does make mistakes, right? It upshifts when it shouldn't and things like that. But, uh, but you think of that as automation rather than autonomy. And again, there's probably this slippery slope, but I think... Uh, a lot of what we're doing is automating functions and providing pilot assist, and that's incredibly valuable, but well short of autonomy. Right. Yeah. I also wanted to ask. Uh, by, by the way, just you're, yeah. I, I just strongly agree. Remember, you know, unmanned autonomous vehicles or uh, so on. Huh? That language did not persevere. The right. Air Force calls them remotely piloted vehicles right. for a variety of reasons to emphasize <clears throat> that someone's in control and is flying them. And teleoperation replaces. Automated, even at NASA. Yeah. Okay, so those language shifts affect the design that yeah. the engineers make. So I think you're uh, overly optimistic about the standardization of cars. One of the uh, values of uh, car to go and reach now and stuff like that is I get to try lots of cars. And the only thing that's standard in cars these days is the steering wheel, the gas, and that's the true. brake. Every, I mean, I have sat with my wife in some BMW that we rented for 10 minutes and laughed hysterically for five minutes as we tried to figure out how to make the damn thing go. Okay, just, I can't figure out how to flush the toilet in some hotel. Yeah. <laughs> Tear my <laughs> Yeah, right, 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 right. It's wireless. Don't worry. <laughs> you have to take out your iPhone. To I mean, no, no, the, the, the cameras will take care of it. Don't worry. <laughs> Just a, a, a slightly different perspective. Again, not sure if I'm right about it, but uh, keeping the conversation lively. And it's twofold. One is, whatever you think about the wording and about how it was introduced, uh, g going back to Moshe's point, somewhere down the road, some people think it's five years, some people think it's 50, some people think it's 20. Sometime down the road, cars will be a lot safer than they are today due to increased automation, not increased autonomy. And that means that the Faustian bargain that we've struck with the uh, transportation industry for decades of it's not just the 30,000 people killed on the highways, it's the million people being injured and so on. It's the fact that, say, uh, older people have their autonomy restricted because you really need to take the keys away from, from grandpa so he doesn't uh, kill anybody. It's the fact that the problem's getting worse due to te you know, driving and texting. So uh, Google and Tesla and whoever you might quibble with uh, I think could rightly say, don't bite my finger, look at where I'm pointing. I'm pointing towards a future where all of us are, are much, much uh, safer. That's point number one. Point number two, even in the short term, it is remarkable to me that Tesla was able to get their car out with the terminology, with the limited uh, set of um, techniques. And as far as I know, accident rate did not go up. Uh, so it just, uh, I, I wonder if the path that we're on, even in the short term, uh, isn't the one that we think we're on. Because I think the line of thinking we had here, uh, it was clear that Tesla wouldn't launch. A priori, I would have said, no way, there are going to be a couple of accidents. Nobody going to show that Tesla is a thousand times, times uh, safer. Uh, you know, Regulators are going to shut it down. People are going to be revolting uh, in the streets. And in point of fact, again, maybe it's Elon Musk's you know, uh, uh, voodoo, but uh, it's launched. And uh, it's you know quite successful from a driving point of view, except for the poor person, except for a very small number of people. I think the other thing we're not mentioning here is that even if he came to me and said, you know what, autonomous driving is no safer than driving you know yourself. Um, having the car being able to drive for me 
um, represents such a huge improvement in my quality of life that like that's a huge gain for me, even if there's no safety gain at all. You're saying it's kind of killer app. It's a killer app. <laughs> but that, that will not that will not fly with with, uh, with society. The fact that it's important to you, if we continue to have the same rate of car accidents, that will not be accepted with the regulators. But isn't that well isn't to, to the regulators or to society? Look, isn't that what's happened? Nobody has said that I know or convincingly argued with data that Tesla cars have a smaller accident rate. I don't think they have a bigger accident rate. So basically, the reason that they're on the road is that some people buy them, you know, because they're electric, because they're slick, for whatever reason. It's I'm not sure that this discussion is look, look at the Look at the hoopla that happened with every, with the Tesla accident, with the Uber accident. Look at the national hoopla. Now imagine that this, that this happens, you know, 10 times a day. No, I, I, I'm actually skeptical. If this happens, you know, we had two yeah. major fatal accidents, a huge national hoopla about them. Multiplied by 10, there would be very different reaction. Or it would be boring. The old news wouldn't even be worth reporting. I, I like the su suggestion you had before. I mean, I think if the engineers, designers, and the manufacturers had a more nuanced approach and a progressive thing, the golf cart at 25 miles an hour, you know, there's a whole host of applications. When, when the system is more closed, like an a interstate highway that has limited access and fences to keep animals off and other kind of <laughs> control points and more monitoring and safer roads, then you can begin to, to roll it out there. The harder things are the in-city and the last mile kind of activities, and those are going to be more challenging. Yet the focus has been, let me show you how cool I can make it. And I, that's the quote that I skipped over in the FAA, that's an F, uh, the NTSB report, which said there was a culture at Tesla which said, if we can automate it, we should. And that was, that's the wrong thing, but you want to be more cautious. Uh, yeah, it's, it's slightly unrelated to Warren's profit. I'd be curious, we've talked a lot about like autonomous vehicles and things, but I'd be curious to hear more about your thoughts on what, what if anything, should be done about bias in uh, like data. Like, for example, um, it's like no secret that uh, like human people on dating apps, for example, are very biased towards like matching or liking people of certain like races more than others. Uh, and let's say that one day they made like a Tinder made a change that introduced that training data bias into its app and as a result certain like people were like certain people of certain races were shown significantly less than others. Um, I guess to be curious it's a hairy question, but I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are on if a bias like a, a change like that is introduced, like and it negatively impacts some some group of people, where the responsibility lies and if if any um, like what should be done about that? Regulation is hard. And I think we should start with the low hanging fruit rather than the high hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Before we, we regulate dating apps, I would start with, with uh, machine learning, or automated decision systems in the judicial system, or uh, medical record. The, the things that are just much, much easier for us to, you know, there will be much less debate, and I think the policy part is much easier. Trying to regulate, you know, dating apps. It's very, very high up the tree. I would take that in a slightly <coughs> different direction. Um, I, I think, um, well, let me back up. You're probably too young to remember this, but <laughs> way back when Campbell's Soup did an ad, like a number of years ago, that was a gay couple with a kid, and there was a massive outcry about this. Like, they're serving the kid's soup. I mean, nothing's <laughs> happening, right? It's too bad. And, um, and people were really upset. Like really, really upset, and Campbell's response was kind of, well, it's family, and we're advertising soup, and everyone's our demographic because everyone eats soup, and so that's that. End of business question, right? I have no idea how it fared for them. I have no idea if their stock went up or down, but I'm pretty sure that people who are in gay relationships potentially eat soup, and so that's a market that they would probably want to be involved in. And I feel much the same way about companies. Like I think. They're finally starting to understand that everybody doesn't have the same family unit structure, everybody doesn't look the same, everybody isn't the same height, everybody isn't trying to be the same face, style, hire, whatever. And so I think from a purely business perspective, there is an understanding that the less 
you manipulate your system, the more open it is, the more reflective it is of whoever your user base is, the better for business that is, because you're opening it up even broader. I don't, I don't think, though, that solves for the biased data question, which is the minute you have a substantial enough data set that reflects any person, you will find bias in it, because we are all biased. We all have prejudices. We're all racist about something. There's some inference, understanding, human thing that happens there that once you get enough data, you're going to see. So then the ethical question, I think, becomes, do you reflect that accurately? Because that's what we are all about, flawed, imperfect, and making bad decisions occasionally. Or do you overcorrect for that? Which I think is an ethical question in and of itself. Like, are you going to reflect reality or not? And if so, who's reality, right? So I, I staying away from the legal and regulatory aspect of it, I think it becomes strictly a question of who's your target market and how much money are you going to make? And that'll answer that question for you. So, yeah. Um, Could last, I respond to that? I, I, I agree with you about a lot of things. I wonder if that model of you know more open, more control to consumers there mm -hmm. starts to break down once what you're doing is selling targeted advertising or something along oh, those lines exactly. rather yeah. than selling a product. Yeah. Because we, then see the, we see the opposite direction of movement yeah. in Facebook and Twitter and yeah. whatever. And then you get into differential pricing harm, right? Like, you know, and we've seen that for years, right? I think Sweeney's first paper on that was like 2010 yeah. or something. I mean, so we know that happens. So yeah, it completely falls apart once you move to marketing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, the folks from AI2 here, it's been very uh, informative and enlightening. So really a big thank you to the speaker. Yeah.